Well, we're in part three today of our Philippians series titled Selfie and looking how to get past ourselves, looking at the example of rejoicing and enjoying the Christian experience that we see in the Apostle Paul while he's in a Roman prison. And today the title is called Check Yourself. <laughs> and really it's about crucifying the flesh and checking our flesh to make sure that it is out of the way so that God can fully do what he needs to do. So let's pray, and I am super, super excited uh, to deliver the word here this morning. Father, thank you for all that's taken place so far. I feel every single Sunday when I finally get to the pulpit to deliver the word, I feel like we've had so much of church already. Thank you, God, for the testimonies, the great worship, the reports of what's going on around the world, the encouragement that we have with one another. Thank you for laughter. Thank you we're not a church that's all about every little tiny detail and to make such a smooth performance. We're gathered as a family. We're here under your roof, Father, to hear from you, to encourage each other, to hear from heaven. So bring, Father, an individual word to each and every one of us. Go before us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. A few years ago, I was listening to a podcast, and uh, it was the TED Talk podcast. So I don't know if you're familiar with TED Talk, the 20-minute uh, talks on experts from all around the world. Uh, but this one wasn't necessarily an expert, but he was an amazing chef. His name was Chef Jose Andres, and he was from Puerto Rico, a famous chef. But during the hurricane in 2017 that absolutely obliterated Puerto Rico, he felt a holy discontent and a burden to minister to the people on the island. See, the problem was that FEMA and the Red Cross, they were present, but they weren't doing anything. At that moment, they needed to feed people and take care of the injured, and they weren't doing it. What they were doing was in conference rooms, discussing what they should do, planning what they should do, writing out ideas on the whiteboard, but they weren't actually feeding the people. And so this chef, he thought, this isn't rocket science. This isn't difficult. So he called every chef that he knew on the island and used their resources, brought them together in a central location, and they just started cooking. Flavors of the island, rice and beans and, and the, the fruits and the different meats they have on the island, not that prepackaged powdery, just that water mush that you get from, you know, like astronauts should be eating, but real food that brings encouragement, nourishes the soul. So they started cooking, and that day they fed about a thousand people. And news spread, and whenever there's an answer, whenever there's a, a testimony, it seems to awaken people and they come to the source. So by the, by the next day, they were now serving over 7,500 meals per day. Word kept getting out, and so now warehouses and, and supply warehouses were giving all these resources of water and food and other things to this chef. And it's like, whatever you're doing is working, and we want to support it. So by the next week, they had moved across the street to a small coliseum, and at that point, they were giving out 75,000 meals per day. And he and his TED Talk said this amazing statement. He says, we weren't trying to look for the answer. We had the answer. It was to cook, <laughs> just to go. Not sitting there trying to figure it all out, but to just go and to do. He had the answer. And today, you know, I'm, I'm a preacher, so I hear a story like that, and I automatically start thinking, okay, how is this spiritual? How can I use this as a pulpit? What does this mean to us? And I learned that the world is desperate for the answer. The world is hungry. The world is lost. The world is, is needing something beyond themselves that goes beyond even their own lives. They're looking for the answer. Now, we know the answer, don't we? What's the answer? Jesus, come on, girl. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. In any situation we face in life, Jesus is the answer. Let me ask you this. What's one plus one? Simple question. What's one plus one? No, it's Jesus. Jesus is always the answer. <laughs> Jesus is always the answer. Don't use that for a test. Don't use that in a driving test. And the pastor told me that Jesus is the answer. I should get an A. No, you're going to fail, so be careful. But I believe that when the people of God who know the answer can take it a step further and manifest the answer, be it signs, wonders, miracle, extending love, encouragement, support, being a shoulder to cry on, when we manifest the answer, I feel it does something to the hurting and the lost. It draws them into the source. It says, I don't know where you got that love. I don't know why you have that peace, but where did you get it? 
It's not us shaking a finger at them, bashing them over the head with the Bible, arguing and, and debating with people. That's not what Jesus did. He was an extension of the Father's love who drew people to his embrace once again. And we have the answer. And that's the great news that we have as believers. We don't have to look for the answer. We have the answer, but there's still a problem. And the problem is though 80% of this country claims to be Christian, it seems like our country keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And why is that? I ask myself the question, what is holding us back? What, what is keeping us from manifesting this answer? And I think that the problem is that the Christian church has morphed into being a self-sacrificing organism, a family, a, a spiritual force to be reckoned with to a self-help club. You know, we focus more on trying just not to do bad, not to sin, and self-personal growth more than we do on manifesting and releasing what God has called us to do, even when it's scary. So we know that sin means that you've missed the mark. So sin is when you do something wrong. But sin could also be when God calls you to do something right, but you don't do it. It's still disobedience. And there's this uh, great quote from some old dude from centuries ago, and he said this. He goes, that the fuel for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. It's not that evil is so present in our world. It's not that, that Satan is just winning wars and battles all around us. That's not the case. It's not that bad people are doing bad. It's that good people who have the answer are too scared, are too timid, and they hesitate. And they don't listen to what God has called them to do. If God has called you to it, he will get you through it because he equipped you. He won't lead you into something without fully equipping you with all that you need. So we know that as believers, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We have been filled with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Our spiritual bank account is full. It's completely overflowing. So I believe that the only thing stopping you is you. The only thing keeping you back could be something as simple as getting past the flesh. And isn't that amazing? How we can be a born-again, spirit-filled believer, anointed, called by God, commissioned to make disciples of all nations, and something as simple as the flesh can stop the will of God in our own lives. It's that critical and it's that important. And the Apostle Paul, as we're studying his epistle in Philippians, giving us some great encouragement here. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to chapter 3 of Philippians. We're going to read the first about 14 verses. And again, if you're first time joining us in this series, Apostle Paul, arrested in Jerusalem, uses one in a time appeal to talk to Caesar. He takes quite a journey to get there, gets shipwrecked, but eventually we believe he was in house arrest in Rome awaiting to appeal to Caesar. And he writes the most joyful book in the Bible in the middle of being in a horrific place. Beginning in verse 1. And I love the title in the New American Standard here of this chapter. It says, the goal of life. Hey, thank you, Apostle Paul. You're making it easy on us. The goal of life. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. One of the 16 times that word is used in this book. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Time out there. What he's talking about is uh, this group of people that have become saved, but they still were trying to abide by the Jewish customs and laws. It's like, okay, you can accept Jesus, but you're still Jew, so uh, you still got to abide by all these rules. Otherwise, you're not really saved. So some... Uh, misconceptions going on in the church there, and Paul is bringing some correction. Verse 4, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has in mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the nation of Israel, to the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteous, which is in the law, found blameless. So Paul is saying here, you guys are thinking, that it's not just in Jesus and his grace alone. You're thinking it's in rules? And you're thinking that because you're better than other people because you follow rules? No. 
He goes, if that's the case, I got all y'all beats, okay? I graduated, you know, valedictorian of Harvard, okay? I was born in the right family, in the right place. I did everything perfect. I mean, there were 1,613 Jewish laws on top of God's laws, and it says that he was found blameless. He persecuted the church. I mean, a Pharisee saying, I got all this. I got you guys beat if you want confidence in the flesh. But then he says this in verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be in loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a whole lot in there. It's like Romans chapter 8 or Romans chapter 5. There's so much depth as to what Paul is trying to teach us. And so I'm going to try to help us be encouraged this morning and break down uh, a little bit of what I believe Paul was trying to communicate. If you're taking notes in your bulletin, you have a couple fill-ins, also some of the references of scriptures that I'll be sharing. But number one, if we're wanting to check ourselves and to keep the flesh at bay, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what are you believing? What are you believing? The power of your thoughts, the power of your agreement, what are you believing? Because the enemy is full of tricks. I might have shared the story already, but I'm going to share it again because I like it. But when I was a kid, I loved this TV show called Magic Secrets Finally Revealed. I loved magic shows as a kid. Now, it wasn't demonic. I know it was all a trick, right? But this magician who put a mask on showed everybody how the greatest tricks were done. What was the secret behind sawing a woman in half? What was the secret be behind Houdini's straight jacket underwater trick? And this magician for like eight episodes showed so many cool tricks and, and how they were done and all the things behind it all. Then at the very end, he took his mask off and said, fellow magicians, I am not trying to destroy you. I'm trying to encourage you and challenge you to be better, to not stick by the same tricks, but to do more and to be better. And it made me think of the enemy because these tricks that the magicians were using were so simple. Like you made an airplane disappear? No, you were just on a rotating platform and you didn't realize it. The trick is so simple. The trick is so easy. But the trick is so powerful because once you know it, it completely destroys the magic of magic. It completely eliminates the power. You're like, oh, he didn't really saw the woman in half. It was two women in there and they were divided. <laughs> I feel conned. And it, it removes the power from what was magic. And the same thing with the enemy. When you discover the enemy's tired, boring, century-old tricks, you're like, I got deceived that way? He was able to influence me, and it's such a small little trick. But if we believe it, if we accept it, it turns into something powerful. See, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were perfect. No sin, no sorrow, no shame, nothing that would separate them from the Father. They walked with God in the cool of the day, and they had intimate relationship with God. But they were tricked, and they were deceived. God said, y'all can have all the food in the whole world that you want. Don't touch this tree. And like a toddler, don't go into the kitchen. You can go anywhere else. Don't go in the kitchen. I'm not going in the kitchen. They're going in the kitchen because he told them not to. Well, sure enough, Adam and Eve... They were told by God, don't eat of this tree. If you do, you're going to die. Bottom line, you eat it, you die. If God told me that, it'd be like, I'm not even looking at the tree, okay? <laughs> I'm staying as far away as I can. In fact, I'm moving. I don't want to be anywhere near the tree. But they went to that tree, and the enemy came in in, in Genesis 3, 5, and said, did God really say not to eat? You won't die, because God knows that when you eat of that, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. And she thought, yeah, I, I can be wise like God. I can be like God. And they took a bite and they, they entered sin into this entire world. 
for all, all of eternity. They welcomed the first sin. And what's crazy about that is that the enemy got Adam and Eve to try to get through sin what they already had in God. He said, if you do this sin, you'll be like God. Don't you remember back in Genesis 1, 26, 27, that I have made man in my image, in the very likeness of God. They were already in the image and the likeness of God. They are already like God. But the enemy used a tiny little trick to welcome sin so that the spirit man would die and that we would await a savior and go through literally hell on earth because of that one sin. We have to be careful what we believe. And that one sin, welcome in the enemy's power. It separated us from God. And even though we now have Jesus who rose from the dead and we're under a new covenant of grace, the ripple effects of that first sin are still present here today. Though we have the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit filling us, guess what? We still live in a fallen world. Thank you so much, Adam and Eve. I'm sure it's, oh, my Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, Holy Spirit. When we get to heaven, and then Adam's going to be there like, yeah, my bad, sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry you had to go through all of that. That's what it's going to be like in heaven, I believe. That's going to be our welcoming committee. But we have to be careful what we believe. In the New King James Version, I always use New American Standard, but Proverbs 23, 7, in the New King James Version, it said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The way you believe is the way you will be. Bottom line. We have to be careful what we allow into our heart. And here's the thing. God won't force you to believe. He won't make you believe. Believing is this overflow of love that we have from God. So we need to fully believe what God has done in our spirit. And I talk about body, soul, and spirit all the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that you may be sanctified through and through in your spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit was dead before. Now it was resurrected in Christ, and you are a new creation, meaning that you are without sin, you are wall-to-wall Holy Spirit, and you are perfect in God. You are hidden in Christ. You are perfect. So husbands, you can tell your wives, you married the perfect man. And wives, you can say the same thing. Ooh, you married the perfect lady, right? Because in our spirit, we are perfect. That's our real identity. Our soul is just our personality, our mind, will, and emotions, and our flesh is just a puppet. Our flesh does whatever the spirit has decided. Whatever the soul has decided, that's what the flesh does. So we need to be very cautious about what we believe. I might have shared before the analogy of the adult, the rebellious teenager, and a toddler. Your spirit is the adult. Your soul is that rebellious teenager, and your flesh is the toddler. And the problem is that too many believers are allowing the toddler to be the boss in the relationship. The toddler should not dictate the decisions and choices you make in life. The adult should. And the way we do that is through the power of renewing our mind. Because not only are you perfected in Christ, but you are also dead to your old self. So we need to be aware that we need to keep our minds renewed so that we don't act like a dead person, but we act like this perfected person that we truly are and that God has made us. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we all know it. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And this is very fascinating to know because when God said, if you eat of this tree in the Garden of Eden, if you eat of this tree, you will die. He wasn't saying you're going to physically die. He says there's no sin that separates us. If you eat of this tree, you're going to spiritually die. And your spirit will be dead, needing the resurrection that comes only through Christ and what he did for us, which is so amazing. And here's, here's the tool, here's the trick we really need to keep our minds renewed. I'm going to read to you just a couple quick verses. It's in Ephesians 4, uh, 22 uh, to 24. It says, That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. We are to renew our minds so that we're not walking around with the dead man, but that we're living as the new man. I think that so many Christians today are struggling in the faith because you're carrying the corpse of your old man over your shoulders. There's an extra weight you were never designed to carry. And we got to let go of that lie. We got to let go of those doubts. We got to let go of that fear. We got to let go of what mistakes we made in the past that are not our identity and it's something that God doesn't see over our lives. But that comes from the renewing of the mind. 
Galatians 5, 22, or 24 says that those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh along with its lust and its passions and desires. It's something we have the responsibility to do. So what you believe is so critical. What are you believing? Number two, what are you eating? What are you eating? Uh, for those who know, my family, we're, we're dog lovers. We're dog people. We've had a number of different doggies and puppies in our lives. And one thing I love to do that you shouldn't do, but I love to do, is feed dogs people food. I used to get in trouble as a kid because my mom had this little uh, chihuahua named Tito. And uh, I used to feed him beans because I just thought it was the funniest thing in the world to feed a Mexican dog Mexican beans. <laughs> and I would feed him. My mom's like, stop doing that. You gave him diarrhea last week. I'm like, sorry, it's, it's hilarious. And then one, one year, we, we got these amazing, cute little miniature dachshunds, little weenie dogs, a pair of weenie dogs. But the thing with weenie dogs is that they're prone to get plump <laughs> really easily. And because they're so long, you can't overfeed them because of their spines. So you have to actually underfeed them a little bit so they stay slightly underweight to remain healthy. So we had to ration out their dry food, and the only snacks I could give them was carrot sticks and cucumber slices, maybe some apples. That was it. So it broke my heart because I, I, I wanted to feed them, but I didn't want to hurt them. And then those dogs, uh, we, we rehomed them and um, stayed without dogs for a while, and then we rescued my favorite dog of all. Uh, she was a rescue schnauzer uh, from the streets of Mexico named we gave her the name Letty because she was the bearded lady from The Greatest Showman. We named her that. And the, just the best dog ever. She passed away two Thanksgivings ago. Broke my heart. I've never cried harder in all my life. It was embarrassing. Anyway, uh, we got this dog, and she was all matted. And we got her, uh, you know, groomed and bathed. And then we took her to the vet to get a once-over. So we take her to the vet, and the vet's looking. Oh, yeah, for her age, she's really in great shape. And she's strong. She's like, but she's pretty underweight. I said, what? He goes, yeah, Schnauzer's are supposed to be stocky, meaty dogs, you know, 16 to 20 pounds. She's like at 12. You need to feed this dog more. And I said, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> and so, and Schnauzers love to eat. I mean, they're, they're farm dogs that eat vermin all day long. And so not only did I give her more food and bought every dog treat imaginable I could, but now every day I was giving her a puppy-sized version of the food we ate. So if we were eating lamb chops, Letty was eating lamb chops, right? And I got her to the weight that she needed to be. And now I had the freedom to actually give her people food and knew that it's a dog that could handle it. She was absolutely best. And I asked the question, why eating? Why should we look at what we're eating? Because what you don't eat can make you healthier. What you do eat can make you stronger. And in the spirit, it's that same way. In the natural, when you eat food, you get full. You go out and have steak and potatoes, you're going to get full for at least a few hours. But in the spirit, when you eat and feast on the word of God and feed on God's truth, you actually get hungrier. It grows your desire for more of him. And we have to be careful what we're eating because Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So not only do we have to be mindful of what we're believing because it'll allow us what we become and what we be, but we have to be careful what we're ingesting, what we're taking in on a heart and on a soul matter because it's going to determine our response or our reaction. We should never react to the devil, but only respond to the Father in life. I believe it's the Alaskans, they have this, um, this thought, this uh, analogy that inside every human being, there's a good dog and a bad dog. And whichever one you feed the most is going to be the one that determines your behavior. So we want the good dog to be an obese Great Dane, and we want the bad dog to be a teacup chihuahua. What you feed, what you feed on is going to determine your response. And so there is power in doing the little things in life. There's so much power in doing little things God's way consistently. I remember when I planted a church, I was uh, working all day long as a maintenance man and then working all night long and all weekend long as a church planter, and I gained a few pounds, I'll say. I was at my highest weight, and I remember I want to, I'm, I'm sluggish, I want to feel better, I want to look better. So I went on a very strict diet. I lost 30 pounds in 60 days. I felt good, I looked good, I was all happy. And once I finished the diet, would you have guessed it? Within two weeks, I gained seven pounds back. Now, church, I promise you, I wasn't trying. 
I was not trying to gain weight. I don't know where those pounds came from, but they came quickly. That's unfair. I can't wait to have my heavenly body where Doritos don't matter. But I know that it's the little things I did every day. I went from a strict diet to, oh, it's just one cheeseburger. From a strict diet to, oh, what's one bag of Doritos? Before you know it, your mind shuts off and you just start going for it, and that weight comes right back. So I had to get back to being consistent. And I'm not trying to be dogmatic with it, but just consistent. So what happens in our lives when we stay consistent with the word that God put on our heart in the morning? We become consistent in our worship. We get to this place where we're constantly looking to God and making sure that our affection is upon him. So what are you believing? What are you eating? And then finally here, the last point, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? What is your focus? What is your value system in life? You see, when Paul surrendered to Jesus, more so when the Holy Spirit kicked him off his horse and blinded him for three days, and he realized Jesus was the answer, everything in his life and culture changed. He went from this Hebrew of Hebrews, a pharisaical religious man who persecuted the church, to giving his very life for the gospel. Everything changed when he met Jesus, and his perfect life changed, his priorities changed, his values were completely altered because of what he saw in Jesus, this radiant light. He found this encounter with the Jesus, the one he was persecuting. And when we come into an encounter with the presence of God and the encounter of Jesus, it should determine our focus. It it should determine the values that are set forth in our hearts. It's amazing how easy it is for us to get distracted and to change what what we're focusing on. You know, the saddest thing in, in the world is when at the end of the day, you get your phone and you spend all day long doing stuff and all day long on your phone. And there's this little thing that shows you the amount of time you are on your phone. It shows you a breakdown of all the apps by percentages of where you spent your time. It's the saddest thing in the world when you look at the end of the day and like, I spent 23% of my day on Facebook. I was on the internet for 10% of my day. I was on this app, which has nothing to do with Jesus for that many percentage. Like, oh my Lord. It's amazing when we get a wake-up call to where our focus really is, an attitude check of of where our heart really is. There's a pastor that I I so appreciate, and he says, I will watch anything, see a movie, watch TV, read anything, but the moment I feel my affection from the Father lift, I stop it. I'll turn that TV off, I'll shut that book, I'll change direction, and I'll worship. And um, as a matter of fact, he would take every single day what he calls five-minute vacations. The moment he gets flustered, the moment he gets angry, the moment he feels his focus and his values shifted, he goes, time out, take the phone off off the ringer. I'm going to be in my prayer closet for just five minutes to recalibrate and to get back into the heart of what I should be doing, and that's focusing on God the whole time. Let me conclude with this uh, final testimony. There was a uh, nine-year-old Nigerian girl who saw the love of Jesus and begged her parents to become a Christian. It wasn't so easily accepted at that time. So for her ninth birthday present, they allowed her to be a Christian. And she, from that day, began to live for Jesus, period. She gave her life completely over. She was fully surrendered, fully his. But as she grew older, she became an activist and looked around not only in her own community and her own country, but on the entire continent of Africa and just looked at at the heartbreak and the devastation and the poverty and, and all the different issues, you know, the genocide and so many things. And she wanted to have an answer, but she knew that the answer was Jesus. If we just manifested the answer, that is what we need in this country. This is what Africa needs. It's more and more of Jesus. But she noticed in her travels and her campaigning and her speeches that she would go to village and village and city and city And in every, even the tiniest village, there was always a church. And in that village, there wasn't a hospital, a market, even a school, but there was always a church. And at first, she got really excited. She's like, praise God, the gospel is being shared and and churches are being planted all over the place. But there was a problem because on Sunday, the churches were full. On Sunday, they had these beautiful buildings with with sound systems that were greater than all the concert halls in, in their communities. They had resources. They had money. They, they were giving hope. They were blessing people. But then Monday through Saturday, nothing was happening. The doors were closed. The lights were off. And she says, what a tragedy to see everybody so focused on God one day of the week and completely shift their focus to other things throughout the other week. When the world is hurting for the answer, 
and we can simply say, I'm doing my duty, checking out the list. I'm going to church once a week, but from Monday through Saturday, I'm living for myself. And I just want to challenge us here today that there is something uniquely powerful and individually powerful in your life that happens when you decide, my focus was off. My flesh got in the way. This toddler in my uh, personal trinity has taken charge and needs to be put in the back seat. And when you make that switch and you make that commitment and you crucify the flesh and allow your spirit man to rise up, you're going to begin to see things, not only see things that you've been wanting God to do in your life, but I believe that you're going to, and this may be prophetic, you're going to encounter shifts in your emotions that are supernatural. Even this past week, I mentioned to my wife, and I said, I have just been getting waves and hits of joy. And I don't know, it's because I'm just so focused on rejoicing in the book of Philippians or God has just done one miracle after another in our lives in the recent months. But I just sat there like, I'll just be out of nowhere driving and just get hit by what I can only describe as supernatural joy. And I'm just declaring the same thing for us this week, that as we focus on crucifying the flesh, you may have been hurting for energy, hurting for more joy, hurting for more connection in your marriage, hurting for something, but maybe it's not that you need to look for the answer. Maybe it's your flesh that's been preventing the answer because you've had it all along. So let's pray and let me impart. Father, I just thank you for your goodness here today and I thank you for your everlasting love. A gentle yet powerful reminders that our heart should be yours. Our focus should be on you. I thank you, Father, for all that you have done in and through our lives and the valleys that we've gone through, the mountaintop experiences. But this week, Father, as we are moving in this book of Philippians and now encouraged and challenged by Paul to crucify the flesh, may you give us the strength that we need. May you give us the perspective that we need to crucify the flesh. Let our spirit man rise up to give you full attention to move in and through our lives, in our marriages, in our community. Thank you for the blessing, the protection, the prosperity that's upon our lives. And as we go today, we completely go in your love and in your joy. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you all. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.